Thank you, Rizzi. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me here. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come out and, and speak about blueberries. Um, I was just kind of sitting in the back of the room and I got to thinking, I said, where's Virginia in the, in the world of blueberries? You're sitting right next to uh, New Jersey where it all really started. And uh, you've got the dominance of Michigan sitting up on top of us and you've got a huge production system here in South Carolina just below you. And then of course, Georgia and, and Florida. And when you start looking at the statistics, um, Virginia just gets lumped into United States. Uh, it just doesn't even, it doesn't even pop up on the uh, NASS statistics. Uh, it's growing and it's growing worldwide. They're producing it in, in Chile um, and they're producing it in Australia. They have European uh, variety, or not varieties, but our varieties of blueberries there. Um, blueberry comes from the Western Hemisphere and it is a plant that um, has sustained Indian populations for a number of years. It is a, it's a hardy plant that likes to grow into, in conifer, or conifer forests. It's an acid-loving plant, uh, meaning it, the soil pH of it needs to be lower than what normal crops are, and it has uh, very distinctive behaviors different from what we've been listening to uh, as far as blackberry goes. So the first thing, if you are interested in blueberry, you should think about is how am I going to move that? We had just two great sessions on marketing and what to do and different ways of bringing in people, whether you want to do the U-Pick direct, if you want to do merchandising. There's just a number of different ways to do that, but you need to really start to invest some time in understanding that before you put the first plant in the ground and start thinking about production. Because what you want to do is you want to know ultimately when those little berries are blue, can I get them off the bush off my farm and get some money back in my pocket for what I've just done. And so take very careful consideration of that. Learn um, the post harvest of the blueberry, learn the production of the blueberry, learn anything you possibly can about how blueberries are marketed, the health benefits of blueberry. And the more you understand this crop, the easier it will be in order to get that into a situation and a market that is desirable for the outcomes that you wish to pursue from this. Of course, it's a biological entity and the environment can wreak havoc on you at any moment in time and that is the risk of farming. Really that is what I'm just going to talk about on the marketing part of this. The rest of it, let's talk about the plan. Let's talk about putting this together. What does it take? Um, establishment costs. They can be horrendous for blueberries. Uh, up in the area, area of six hundred to twenty-five thousand dollars an acre, six thousand to twenty-five thousand dollars an acre. I mean, that's a really considerable outlay putting in a blueberry planting. Uh, the reason I say this is you're going to have to have irrigation, and if you're going to grow blueberry and you're going to grow it up here and you want to try to use some of the cultivars that are earlier in the season, you're going to need frost protection. You're going to need to have the capacity to get that water out on those flowers to protect them during freezes. And then you also have to manipulate the land. The land must be manipulated. The pH of the soil needs to be downward of 5.5 to 4.5. That means you're going to have additions that you're going to do in there. Then you're going to have bedding practices, just like your, uh, the, the blackberries and the raspberries you've seen. You're going to have bedding. You're going to have trellis. You're going to have inputs. You're going to have tractors. You're going to have all kinds of different considerations when you consider these costs. Labor availability is huge. You're talking about a crop like the blackberries. You have to have a hand out there on each one of those individual fruits to get that fruit to market. So you have to be able to ensure that you have a labor source at a ready available timing for that production to take place. So when it's ready to harvest, you can have a hand in that orchard. Accounting. Now I've kind of put this down here. I've been talking about it, the money, but you really need to take these outlays, look at it, say what are my returns, look at those costs that you saw on the, on the, the national statistics for blueberries and say can I make money at this before you even get started. And then you decide, yes, I want to start doing this. Then you have to start to decide, okay, there's different types of blueberries. There's low bush, medium bush, high bush. There's the rabbit eyes. You have a number of different plants to choose from. The low bush, you won't use those down here. They're basically a main strawberry. They're a, pros or a, sorry, a blueberry that's 
harvested for process. It's almost like um, growing cranberries. They're just going to scoop those up. They're going to become frozen. They go in there. You're not going to see that. They're not going to do well down here. You're not going to get the chill hours on them. We talked about chill hours a little bit earlier, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. So what you're really going to look at is you're going to look at rabbit eyes or high bush. These are, these are the two species of blueberries that are going to be acceptable for your area. So then out of these two species, there's kind of a sublet of, of high bush. There's the northern high bush, and then there's the southern high bush. You'll notice that um, it, let's see, do we, can we get, oh yeah, okay. So we have the coreobosum here in the northern high bush, and you also have the coreobosum in here. But you notice that this has interspecific hybrid in there. So there's some other things that have gone into the southern high bush to reduce the chill hours so that we can have a cropping system in low chill environments. Then we have the rabbit eye. The rabbit eye is more of the natural um, indigenous blueberry to the south. And this particular blueberry is the one that most of the blueberry production that we see coming up in the southern regions of the United States, the southeast, is the blueberry that was, was the inceptor, the mover into the market because it was fairly easy to grow and it was fairly easy to maintain. So right here I have a couple of pictures. You'll see one a powder blue and, and a southern high bush star. Um, While you would pick a high bush or a southern high bush in a lot of these situations, this is going to be the early variety. This is the variety that's going to set you off. As you know, whenever you get a glut in market, prices go down when the fruit volume goes up. So what you're always trying to do is have that fruit volume going into the market at the lowest point with the highest price. That is why Southern High Bush has gained so much popularity because it's low chill and it's early into the market. It makes it very competitive. So then we have to think about Virginia a little bit. Um, there's three basic regions that you're going you're gonna to grow blueberries in here. Uh, there's the mountains, and you're going to see northern high bush in that region. That has the chill hours, and it, probably the heat units won't be so bad. Um, in Georgia, I never tell people to grow northern high bush in the, in the Piedmont or the mountainous regions there because the, the heat units during the summer are so high that they just inhibit the growth of the plant. But here, you could have and easily grow northern high bush in your mountains. But where you're really going to see a lot more production is when you start moving into your um, areas where you have access to markets, your population centers. So you're going to probably want to be thinking about your Piedmont regions and then also down in your coastal plain regions. Now you have a lot different uh, characteristics there. Um, you'll see that um, the, 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 um, uh, the, the Good grief, I'm, I've gone to a blank here. Okay, the average minimal temperature in the hardiness plant zones in those areas are, are in your eights and your sevens. So then your chill hours then are more acceptable for those regions. Doesn't mean you won't have frost problems. Okay, so the chill hours. The chill hours are very important when selecting varieties to plant because what you're going to do is you're going to match this cold hardiness zone to the chill hours on this plant. And so when you start Thinking about chill hours, Alejandra related to this, there is a number of ways of calculating it, but the average way of calculating a chill hour is the number of hours below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And then so that accumulated time and those temperatures in that one winter, winter season, then that provides you with the number of chill hours that goes on there. In South Georgia, one of the worst things that happens is that we can get chill hours of 400, 500, even up to upwards close to 900 hours there. But what happens, we get spikes in Christmas of 80 degrees, we get bud swell and all kinds of things that go on, and then it goes back down again. Or we might get an early freeze. So there's a lot of unpredictability that goes on with that. So when we think northern high bush, we're going to go into a chill hours of about 800 to 1,000. When we think southern high bush, we can go all the way down to 150 and call, come all the way up to about 800. And then the rabbit eyes run around 350 to 700. So then I was asked, what are some of the new varieties that are, are coming out there? I just want to kind of touch on a couple of them. I don't want to get um, into the characteristics of them. What I had noted when I was looking at, at uh, the Virginia Tech's extension and, and uh, VSU's extension bulletins that are out there, um, there's a lot of older varieties of blueberry that have been noted and characterized as far as growing in these regions. Uh, some of these new varieties, they're not known. Um, and then once again, it's that risk. But here we have 
uh, from Scott Neesmith program, one that's called Camellia. Uh, it has about 500 chill hours. It produces a really nice fruit. It's a southern high bush. And then here's one that's a Susie Blue. It's also got about 400 chill hours. It produces nice fruit. So these are a couple of varieties that are out there. Now, any web search out there, as long as we, we, um, our last speaker re alluded to this, if you have that EDU at the end of that tag on that, on that web search, uh, and you start picking this up, or smallfruits.org, if you start picking up any of this information off of these, these sites, this is fairly reliable information. This is unbiased, um, not trying to sell you something, but it's just research-based information that's out there. So then a couple of other varieties that have, have gained some popularity in the South Georgia region. Um, the sweet crisp varieties coming out of Florida um, are real firm fruit. Uh, they have a really wonderful flavor and they have a nice snap when you, when, you, when you bite into them. They're not really very highly productive, but they are a very high quality fruit. They have some very good characteristics. And then farthing is another one that, that gets passed around quite a bit. This year when we were going through our freezes down there, I had noted that the farthing buds had not expanded as much. They weren't out as much as some of the earlier varieties, and yet it was still coming on with your standard varieties. Um, the freeze on them wasn't as, as detrimental. But farthing also has kind of a negative characteristic. A lot of times the ripe fruit, when you pick them where the pedestal was, there'll be a little green back on that. And that's something that detracts from this quite a bit when it goes into the market. But once again, if you're looking at a pick your own situation or if you've got some direct marketing and you can explain this to the, to the consumer and they understand what's going on, there might, might not be any problems with it. Olachne is a rabbit eye that has a very high chill uh, and it's very late and it makes a fine fruit. Um, it gives you that opportunity to have a very late window um, as far as blueberry goes, uh, here you go, you're coming off the hump. The prices might start rising right then and there, and you can enter into that market. It's almost like looking at the primocane situation where you get those late blackberries. This is one of the later blueberries that, that is available as far as a rabbit eye goes. And then Titan, this one is an animal. This, is, this thing's almost about the size of a quarter. And these berries um, are wonderful tasting, very, very fine blueberries, um, but I don't even really think there's anything too negative I can say about them. I haven't seen them grow in a commercial situation. It's so new that we're starting to see how it, how it performs, how it reacts, but the size of this berry, if you're taking for direct marketing, you have your CSA or you have your UPIX, these are wonderful presentation pieces to take people out to, this really large rabbit eye blueberry that you can get into your mid-season. Okay, so now we got a few varieties. We know we're going to, we've penciled some numbers out. What do we have? Where are we going to put these? So when we start thinking of a blueberry, um, it's an acid-loving plant. That soil has to be acidic. So what you're going to start looking for are the characteristics. A spodosol is ideal. If you have one of these spodosol soils, there's a lot of humus in it, a lot of organic matter, upwards of 3 to 5%. Um, and the blueberry is going to thrive in this. We kind of have to go back and kind of think about, okay, where does a blueberry naturally come from? I've said it came from a coniferous forest. It isn't living in the middle of a pine forest, but more on the edges towards the streams. It doesn't want wet feet, wants access to water, but it likes being in that duff. So you can have a real cl hard clay layer underneath there, but if you have a nice organic duff on top of that, a blueberry plant can thrive in that so sort of soil situation. But like I said here at the end, however, most soils are somewhat less and you're going to have to do some amendment to those soils in order to make a production system viable for you. So then the first thing you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, I want to go out here. Um, you had a hay field or you had something in production over here, an old tobacco field, or you, you said, you know, or whatever. Maybe you pulled it out of a, a pine forest and you had some pines and you logged them and now you want them in a different production. First thing I really suggest is you get a hold of your extension agent or you take the samples yourself and send some soil samples into a soil testing lab. Um, you'll get back the soil quality that you have, but also note that if um, on the uh, 
USDA Soil Conservation Service, there is uh, maps out there that tells you the soil types that are on, on there and it'll give you the characteristics. And so one of the things about this characteristics is we want to have a permeable soil, something the water can flow through. Blueberry really doesn't like to sit in wet feet, can uh, have a lot of problems with Phytophthora because of those wet feet. So you're going to have a sandy loam soil, loamy sand, coarse sand, but if you have a coarse sand, you want to make sure you have high organic matter in it. You're going to really want to make sure that that pH is anywhere from 4.2 to 5.2 up to 5.5, uh, depending on um, the varieties that you're choosing or the species. Uh, you definitely want to have an organic matter up around 3%. And I really suggest when you ask for one of these assays of your soils, make sure you can get all the way out to your macro and micronutrients out there. Because some of these are highly immobile, such as copper. And if you do need to make a copper additions, it is better to do it when you're doing your preparation of your soil than coming back and trying to amend the soil. Uh, the same thing with phosphorus. You're going to have that phosphorus in the soil before you plant them because it's very inaccessible and it's very hard to get phosphorus to those roots once you're in that situation that you haven't planted. Doesn't mean it's impossible, it just means when those young plants are struggling to get a foothold out there, it's going to be less difficult for them if you prepare the soil before you put those plants in there. Um, Little notes on analysis here. Realize it takes three to six months. Um, one of the ways that you're probably going to adjust pH is using elemental sulfur. Three to six months to get that going. What is going to happen is you got to get that microbe population going up, finding the sulfur. They're going to start eating it. Then they exude sulfuric acid into the soil and they decrease the soil pH. But that takes a while. Those populations have to come up and the nutrient has to be there for its availability. Um, calcium. If that soil has a calcium of over 900 pounds per acre. I really suggest not planting blueberries in there. They are very sensitive to high calcium levels. Uh, it will impede growth, especially if you're going to grow high bush. And then the water table. I was talking about these wet feet. Um, in South Georgia, uh, for the most part, they're growing them in a swamp. They're pulling out the pine trees and they're putting plants in a swamp. So they're having to bed them up at least 18 inches because the water table is usually three or four inches below the, the, the natural soil level out there. So making sure you, you know where that water table is in there is dependent on how big and how tall you're going to make the beds to plant those bushes in. Topography. Um, in the world of grapes, there's a thing called terroir. Uh, this is where the French have, have taken a look at the, at the grape plant and said everything that goes into the grape is what comes out in the wine, and that's the terroir. So when you start thinking of the environment that you're planting a plant in, the environmental conditions that surround that plant, the things that affect that plant is all part of the terroir. And topography is a huge, pro is a huge consideration. Uh, we saw in North Carolina where they were mitigating um, for uh, erosion. Uh, you definitely want to do that um, when you're thinking about making these beds because what you're going to do with blueberry is you're going to make a bed and you're going to plant these plants in them. If you have high water table or if you have so poor soil quality. Um, then also you want, the, another reason is making sure that those, if you, by putting them in a bed, you are trying to help the soil drain so that those roots don't sit in water. And then when you also look at it, if you've got a dip out there in there, that is a pocket where frost will lie. So when cold air falls down into those low spots, that's a huge problem because if you're blooming and you're having a frost, that is an area that's going to be more susceptible to floral damage during that time, that frost, than an area that maybe is a little bit up on a rise and then actually can move that cold air across it. Cold air sinks and it does drain away. So if you put it in a low spot, it can sit and that's where a lot of damage can occur. Aspect and um, exposure. Um, one of the things that I learned, one of my undergrad degree was in viticulture and enology. And there was a lot of growers, I'm from Washington State, uh, a lot of growers in Walla Walla area where they started looking at that angle that they were aiming those plants at to that sun for the greatest amount of inception, thinking that that's going to give it the greatest amount of photosynthetic capacity, and that's going to put all the goodies that it could possibly put in that grape so it can make the best wine possible. So I kind of think that might be also a consideration when we, when we look at blueberries. So blueberries is, are, are um, a kind of a, a nutraceutical in a way because we we're starting to see tests where they're, they're taking people and they're evaluating their health conditions by 
eating a blueberry or not eating a blueberry and finding that blueberries improve health. So there is a number of chemistries that are being developed and so if you can collect the right light inception onto that plant, that means the right amount of those chemistries are going to go into those fruit and that will improve the quality of those fruit. Water, well water, open reservoir, a lot of growers combine the two, especially if you have frost protection. You want to dig out some big holes and have some collection areas from water, but you're going to also want to have a well out there and you're going to take from the well so that you'll have water at, at any time during the heat of the summer so that you can irrigate with. Another test that you should think about, nematodes. Um, there has been a lot of association to this ring nematode as to establishment of blueberries in the soil and minimizing the ability of blueberry to establish. Um, one of the nice things that has been shown in some of the studies is that pine bark, the medium that you're planting them in and using pine bark as a mulch, um, is inhibiting the number or the population size of these nematodes. So I haven't made the correlation that pine bark is, is eliminating nematodes, but if it's lowering the population, it might give your plant a higher opportunity to survive. And then, um, once again, I go back to this suggesting a, when you get a soil sample, this greenhouse report. You can see it has all of the elements sitting out there. You have your zincs and the manganese and your irons, your copper. It's just not a, a, a melic um, one assay that you get where you only get a little bit of phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, zinc, and manganese, and you get your pH. This is a good start, but once again, that copper number, I've seen copper numbers in the sandy soils get very low very quickly, and it does cause some deleterious effects. Um, if you're in really sandy soils, a lot of the nutrients leach away very quickly, so it becomes very important to really identify what is there and what sort of nutrient management I need to put on these plants. Here's an availability chart. I think this is just sticking this up here just for interest in, in its own right. Um, if we start looking right here at this 5.0 number, you can start seeing how a lot of nutrients are very low in, in availability to the plant. But right here, if you see iron, one of the things that you'll see um, if, you, if you're looking at blueberry and you're starting to identify what are some of the, the deficiencies, some of the things that are wrong with it, you'll see iron chlorosis come up many times. Well, iron chlorosis might not necessarily mean you're low on iron. It might m more point to the soil pH has gone out of the range. Once you start rising in this soil pH with the iron and you start going up into the six and stuff, that availability could be minimized by it. Could be a key indicator of, of plant status, soil status. So then what happens if you get in and out of these ranges of pH? What does it affect? I just kind of wanted to show this study here. Um, it really draws onto why it is important to follow this soil pH and that relationship into the yield that you get out of your plant. So you've come, about, come here and look at these rabbit eye plants by Spears in 1984. You see this five number. I chose that five number in the last one for a specific reason. What you can see here is the, is the plant growth and fruit quality goes through the season or go, go, as you go through a season or a year making the measurements and at the different levels of the pHs, there's a definite curve and there's a definite optimal point and it's showing in the rabbit eyes that it's right at about five. And so it becomes very important just to doing soil samples on a regular basis while you're doing this work so that you can identify what is going on and can I improve my production? Okay, so let's do some land prepping here. This is the beds. Um, there's machinery out there that are wonderful that will help you, uh, you know, bed shapers and, and plastic layers and all these different things. Um, uh, just a few suggestions on it. Uh, uh, average bed is about 18 inches high and we're making them about four foot wide. Um, and then there's commercially available bed shapers. Uh, organic matter is very important because most likely you're going to be shy of organic matter. But really, one of the most important things that I have noted since I started looking at blueberries is that they respond well to pine bark. And so whether if you have fine pine bark or if you've got looser pine bark, whatever the chips are, um, as long as it's in there, there's some debate about whether it needs to be incorporated into the soil or you just plant that thing in the soil and you put that pine bark on top of it. 
What will happen with the high bushes eventually is that pine bark will be the substrate in which that plant grows. You will watch the roots just do nothing. This They will not crawl into the soil. They will stay on the top. Kind of goes back to thinking about the natural habitat of blueberry and coming out of coniferous forests, living on the edge, living in the duff, but not going into that clay layer underneath there. So what you're doing is you're really stimulating the natural habitat by putting down the pine bark for that. This last thing I said, these check little white rocks in there, we have this problem. A lot of times um, when they're chipping pine bark, um, I guess it's kind of like a poor man's concrete. They'll put down some calcium carbonate um, to make a, a solid layer out there so that when they come in and scoop underneath it, they're not picking up a bunch of dirt. They've got a nice thick layer of this, this kind of um, cheap cement. And so what happens is they'll pick up these, chip, these chips and it'll take it in there and you dump all these chips with this calcium carbonate in there out there and you think I'm giving my blueberries the best possible environment I can but yet I just gave it a bunch of calcium carbonate I can't control the pH and so what do you do well when that load comes to you get your nose in there take a look at it if you have an eyedropper and you got a little bit of vinegar inside there you see a white rock a couple white rocks take those set that on the bumper of the truck the little white rock take a drop of that vinegar on there that thing bubbles it's got, it's got um, calcium carbonate in there. And so if that's got calcium carbonate in there, I would reject the load and say, come back with another one. Because I have seen soil that is in between the rows in South Georgia that is at a pH of, I think it was 5.2. And the beds that had been mitigated to drop the pH with, acid, with acidity put it through there, um, sulfuric acid. Um, when we did soil samples out of there because of all the white chips that were in there, the pH of those were at six. And the plants were stunted. They're four-year-old plants. They still look like they were only uh, planted the year before. So they really can have an extremely negative effect on what you're doing. And it's just a little, um, little thing to help you when you go purchase something so you don't end up putting this out there something that is a waste of money and a waste of time. Okay, so it, once again, on this one, I think the biggest thing I can tell you here is this, um, the grid pattern for frost protection, making sure that you set this out. Uh, when you start setting your beds out, flag wherever you've buried things out there. I, because I see that once you start going through there, if you don't have those flags out, you know where everything is at, you can bury that and then you're out there searching for it. One of the things I really saw that works very well is a GPS guided tractor for keeping these nice straight rows so that you can go down there with your mower deck or however you're gonna maintain the center rows, and they will always be the same. You won't have any waves in there. You won't be riding your tractor wheels up onto the, onto the beds and grinding in the roots. Irrigation, laying your pipe down. Um, one of the things I've always thought was kind of interesting um, is this up-down philosophy about the irrigation line, and then you think of that line, and it just got this slow twist in it. I said, how the heck can you get this out of here? You know, there's just no way. You're just, it's just going to constantly, one's going to be upside all over the place. The most thing is, is what you want is you want to be able to have that line clean and clear. So what can you do to make sure that it's clean and clear? Backflow prevention is probably one of the best things you can do. So that way, it's, if, if you shut off the pump, it's not drawing water back in and then drawing up material with, that the, the line is in. That's probably one of the, the best things you can possibly do on your irrigation system to, to mitigate that. Another thing that you should can do that will mitigate clogging lines is test your water. Okay, so we got soil tests, and, you know, and I haven't even talked about tissue sampling yet, but we've we got soil and water tests. But why do you want to test the water? You want to know what the pH is, the dissolved solids, manganese, irons. You want to know that hardness because if you've got really hard water and you're running this through there and you're trying to do that, that's going to start, it, it's going to start getting around the edges of the holes and slowly it'll build up. And it's just like in your bathrooms and with the hard water, that callus is going to get there and it's going to minimize that. So you're going to have to do something to mitigate that. You're going to have to get a filtration system that can do that. You can see right here in this thing, how, how quickly it can, it can clog those emitters out there. So it becomes very important to know backflow and filtration on that irrigation water, especially well, you know, wherever you pull it out of. Bedding, mulch, weave material, we've seen some of that. We've seen, we've seen people talk about plastics. Um, I really like organic material. Um, we have an organic grower here 
that um, they're using plastics. I've always wondered why you just don't take a mower deck and blow all the grasses up underneath there. Um, grass seems to be an excellent mulch in its own right. Um, but the pine bark, rejuvenating your stand every three to five years with pine bark, again, another inch, two inches, excellent, excellent um, weed, weed prevention. It just mitigates that, the, the weediness of the, of the thing. Of course, there's always going to be something that's going to come up, but it's not going to be as intense. Black up or down, we, um, one of the things that uh, in the Pacific Northwest that's been sold is, is, is a white material or a shiny material that they put down between the rows on the fruit trees so that the light reflex comes up into the canopy and then it helps color fruit. Um, I think that that process could very well be going on with the blueberries if people are using white on the upside. Um, but I know lots of people that put the black up because they want to warm up that soil and get that plant operating as quickly as possible. They, and their philosophy is, I can always put water on there to cool it off. So they, they are, their philosophy is to, to entice those roots to grow as early as possible and get the mechanisms going, get the plant up and running. Um, managing weeds, I just talked about the pine bark. Here's just a couple of illustrations. This is one of my test plots in Alapaha on the... Um, lower uh, left hand or yeah the lower left hand side there you can see I did a weed trial on there and I've got an area down there that I just incorporated like three inches worth of pine bark into it that's just a weedy mess I'm out there working I it, it takes me let's see what is that about a 50 foot row there about 20 minutes to go out there and hand weed that I have walked through this other thing in 20 minutes totally on the rest of it. this is an acre and pulled out weeds in 20 minutes on the whole rest of it and that's an acre plot so that pine bark has really proven to be quite useful. Planting, row spacing, um, let's see. A minimum of 10 feet between, really depends on the tractor you have. What have you, what have you invested in into your farm? What can you get up and down between the rows? Um, that's going to really dictate how you're going to put together the orchard. Um, but then the spacing of the plants, uh, a lot of folks grow high bush at a, at a three foot spacing to maximize the number of fruit. Uh, the reason they're doing that is they're pruning them low so that you can get your hands in there and have your people pick them and get, that, get out of there. Once you start getting high, people aren't going to reach up that high to it. And if it gets too low, people aren't going to go down there and reach for that fruit and pull it out of your orchard. So if you have that fruit in a very accessible position, you're going to get it through. Plus, you can move, cruise through your stands a lot faster. So then planting distance is that. Now rabbit eye, I would always suggest on a five foot spacing. Um, I've seen some people go to four, um, but yet yeah, that's a very vigorous plant. The southern high bush can handle the, handle the other spacing quite well. When you pull the plants out of the pot, um, you can see on the um, left hand picture there, if it doesn't have that kind of, if it's this black, black color like this, this could be an indication of disease inside there. Um, and then you can see here on the one on the bottom right, um, that really, that's, that's just the, the plant has just overly grown the roots down there. It's just choking it out. Now there's a couple, there's a couple of practices that are pretty easy to deal with um, on, the, on the roots when they're, that, when they're bound in the pots. Um, just take a pruner up at the top, take a big shear, whack that off, take it on the bottom, whack that off. Any roots that are about a pencil size thin, pull those back around to where they go back into the into the root ball, cut those off there, break that root up and put it in the ground. What you're going to do is you're just going to stimulate root growth coming out of those areas that you just made the slices on. Um, as anybody knows, uh, pruning begets pruning. So why do we go out and we, we knock the apical dominance off of the, the blackberries? And then what we get is branching below it. So the dominance isn't there anymore. That's what happens. So when you take away that apical head, you get branching. So the same thing happens in roots. So what you're doing is you're basically taking away the apical heads, you get branching and that's going to go out. But always break them up. If they're dark colored, don't plant them. Um, really go back to your nurseryman, ask them what's going on. Um, maybe you set them out too long, watered them too much, who knows. But um, you're probably going to be behind if they look that dark color and you go in there. And those plants may not take off, they're probably, they might die for you. 
Uh, planning placement in the center of the bed. Make sure that your irrigation line in those first couple of years is on it. I've had a couple of people say, oh, well, I put the irrigation off by six, ten inches away from where the, the potted plant was in there. And those roots are just going to chase after there and I'm going to get root expansion. I said, but what happens to the plant on a 90 degree day when it's sitting in there and it's not, you know, you can't grow, the, the roots haven't grown to it yet. I mean, are you just starving it on water and drying it out in the spot? And so in those first years, make sure you have water available right to the plant. And then if you want to play little games later once the plant's established about um, some sort of uh, DVI, um, deficit irrigation system or anything like that, fine. But in that establishment period, give them what they want. Give them almost too much because what's going to happen is if you've got fairly uh, porous soil, the water's going to blow right by them very quickly. Um, avoid, when you plant these, avoid planting them too deep. About an inch right there at the soil line in the pot is about all you need to do. Um, as far as covering it. What you want to do is make sure you've got a little bit of soil over the top so that that peat that it was in doesn't dry out quickly. And so then you're just kind of sealing it in there. But you, if you start planting them too deep, you'll have a lot of problems. The plants won't successfully um, come to fruition for you. Most likely they'll die. Um, let's see, water the plants in. Okay, one of the things is these milk cartons and putting that around the base of it. Um, a lot of growers utilize this in the Pacific Northwest, California, and other regions so that they can spray weeds with it. Um, one of the initial thoughts here was with using the southern high bush in, in South Georgia, um, you would get some upright growth and, and kind of change the pattern of that growth so you could get the cash frames underneath there so you could shake the bushes. Um, but I've seen also once they've matured and the next branches come on, whatever the natural growth habit of the plant takes over again. So. I'm not so sure about all that. Here's a little bit of pruning. Um, you got to remember that blueberry fruits on one-year-old wood. So the wood you grow this year will have fruit next year, and the which means obviously the wood you grew last year is where the fruiting wood is now. And so younger wood is more productive. Um, if you're leaving these old, old canes in the center and you're just keep hanging on to that and pruning away everything else, uh, your production is probably going to go down. But if you start pruning out those older canes every five, six, maybe even seven years, letting new renewal canes come in, keeping the crown tight, um, then I think what's going to happen is you're going to have a plant that's rejuvenating itself on it. Make sure there's light inception into the canopy because like we were talking about with the blueberries, when you cut that top, you get the branching coming off of here. That branching is going to knock out light, but what happens is you want to have light coming into the plant so that there's branching going on in there. And then you want air movement through the canopy. This is, this is mostly for disease management, but also transpiration of the plant. If there's air movement going through the canopy, the spores won't be able to lie down there and start to um, metastasize, as it were, or start colonizing and growing. Um, but also, if you have air movement through there, you can move the water vapor out from the stomates quicker. And if you're doing that, that means the transpiration rate of the plant is better and your photosynthetic capacity of the plant is improved. So pruning to open up the canopy for air is very important. Training, um, making sure the crowns are fairly tight, not letting all these suckers come out from all over the place and coming up. Um, watching your re rejuvenation cuts, um, making sure that things are, are, are compact. Um, and easy for your, your people who are going to pick it to pull the fruit off of there. And then it's, the timing is important when you do the pruning. So what are we going to prune? In that first year, we're going to take away this twiggy stuff. We're going to move a lot of that stuff away. We're just going to knock it down. Now, I planted in July last year, and boy, I thought, I'm going to kill the whole thing. Well, this year, it did pretty well. But I didn't severely prune either. I left a lot of leaf tissue out on the plant. But early in the season, when there's going to be buds that rejuvenate for those leaves, knock that down. You want to save those long sticks. You don't want to get these little spindly branch things. That's fine later. But early on, get those long canes started. Get those, those support canes for the bush started. And then you have a little bit of summer pruning once you get going into production. Uh, the southern high bush, we basically just take the top right off of it. Um, at, the, at what level do you, do you knock this down? It, it becomes... Um, a great debate amongst various growers, but you can do this slightly, like in a tipping method, or you could go in there and really severely prune every year. And the response to that is 
really kind of interesting because the stuff that they're tipping, they'll get a long growth, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're picking higher and higher on the, on the bush. On the ones that are severely pruning, it looks like they're getting real good growth back, and the plant is, height is being controlled, and the crop load is fairly controlled. Um, okay, so there's winter is when you want to go take your big cuts out. Um, that was summer pruning to doing the, the, pr the light pruning across the top. Uh, once again, selecting renewal shoots, removing old wood. Um, what you want to do is that low angled stuff that's pouring off into the aisle, uh, alleyways that you're driving that tractor in there. You want to get rid of that material. Just don't let that even bother to come in there. Um, all you're going to do is it's going to irritate you when you start seeing the fruit knocked off every time you go out there and spray or mow or do something with the tractor. And apply a fungicide after you've done your pruning. Anytime you make a cut, um, get out there with some sort of fungicide. Um, and there, I'll show you a, a good place to find out which ones to do that here in a little bit. Um, so when we think about pruning, uh, mechanical harvest is really the, um, I guess that's the gold standard right now where we minimize the amount of, we pay for labor, get the fruit in the, in the buckets, take them into the packing sheds and get that fruit in there. Um, the sorting lines now have color separators, softness separators, um, and size separators. So you can basically get a clamshell of, of, of very nice quality fruit just by running across the packing line. And mechanical harvest helps assist that. But then when you start thinking your value added products and that low process stuff, then, then you've got a lot of process if you had wrong timing in your picking. Um, Gerard Kruer, who was my predecessor, would tell, tell the growers quite often that southern high bush is just a plant looking for a place to die. And so <laughs> with southern high bush, um, when you're going in here and utilizing this plant and trying to revigorate it, rejuvenate it, and, and get it to grow, um, we're looking at a time span in South Georgia and Florida of about 10 years to 15 years for a stand. Um, and peak production usually happens about in the fifth year, and then, then you really have to get, get really smart about the, the nature of the, the plant itself and trying to bring that, that level of fruit quality and fruit yield up in that. Um, let's see. One of the things that also, when we were talking about bedding and making the rows, don't make these rows a mile long. Make them fairly short. One of the things that I see um, a lot of labor crews when they come in there, if they're picking this fruit quickly and they're getting done with the end of the row, they're putting the fruit into the shade, getting, the, the, getting it to the cooler, getting the heat, field heat out of it quickly, they feel like they're getting quality fruit out. They also feel like they're, they're getting done. Every one of those rows makes them feel like, okay, boom, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. I didn't have to walk a long ways to the end of the row to put the fruit up. I'm not losing fruit quality because I have to walk an extra, um, you know, 100 yards to get, to get to my trailer to get that fruit in there and get my ticket. So if they have short, quick, fast turnaround areas that they can get through and pick fruit, um, I believe that that is probably one of the keys to getting high quality fruit out of an orchard very quickly. Okay, so this is just a picture of some severely pruned. They, they prune these down to about 18 inches every year. And so they take that whole thing and knock it down to 18 inches. This, this whole stand was, was nothing but an 18 inch swath at the end of the year. And so you can see the rejuvenation in these pictures right here and how much was in there. And they said the fruit quality and the yield is very acceptable with this practice. So this is something to think about as far as making the, the orchard compact and easy to get through. What's that again? I think it was emerald. It was emerald. And then so I want a little, I'm not going to go into nutrients big time, but I want to talk about nitrogen a little bit. And I want to talk about high bush blueberry and even rabbit eye. Um, ammonia compounds versus nitrate compounds. When we start thinking about these things, um, there is a enzyme that is missing in high bush blueberry leaves and it's called nitrate reductase. Because nitrate reductase is not in there, it can't take a nitrate up, break off the oxygen, eventually take this little nitrogen and turn it into an amino. Why does it turn it into amino? Because it makes an amino acid. Why do we need an amino acid 
it's proteins. Why do we need proteins? That's all the synthesis that goes on in the plant is done by a collection of, of amino acids called a protein. And so they don't have a mechanism to take nitrates and convert that. Another negative thing about nitrate feeding uh, blueberries, it is, has a negative charge. So all the money you spent to get that soil pH down, here you are throwing a negative charge on it and taking away one of those hydrogens out of that soil. And that hydrogen was what was keeping that soil pH low. So when you throw in a nitrate what hap or an amino or even a urea, when it takes it up into the plant, the plant then kicks out two hydrogens and then now we're keeping the soil pH low. And so it's very important when you purchase um, fertilizer to recognize that you're at least using ammonium sulfate or a urea compound. Amical compounds are very important. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, okay, in the first couple of years here, here's just a diagram of what you should feed them at. Uh, feeding rate, if you don't have irrigation, um, one ounce of 10-10-10 uh, bud break July and August. Uh, and then even in the first year with irrigation, you're probably going to go bud break May, July, and August. Um, why are you going to add the May in there? Um, what happens is you're going to lose some of that. It's just going to leach by because you're irrigating and plus the rain that you get. So you're making sure that there's an available nutrient to the plant because you're actually adding water and the potential to um, move that nitrogen below the root zone. So this is just a diagram. It's out there on the web. This is easy to find. Um, but it kind of just tells you what in rabbit eye is the feeding rates over time and um, then through all the way to your sixth year in relationship to height and different um, um, percentages of nitrogens. Okay, so this is a very important slide right here. Uh, if you were gonna copy anything down, uh, I would copy this website down right here. Uh, you'll find bramble IPM on there, strawberry IPM, and you also have blueberry IPM. This is a source to understand what sort of management tactics I'm going to utilize all through the year in order to keep my plants minimized on disease and minimized on insect damage and also weed damage. And it gives the chemistries and that. And there's even an organic uh, blueberry IPM uh, manual available on smallfruits.org now for those who are interested in or, uh, organic production. So what do you get out of the IPM manual? So one of the biggest considerations here is, is the mummy berry. Um, and so cleanliness is, is hugely important. Uh, we were just talking about sweeping off the tops of the plastic, getting rid of all the material that was under there, all those leftover fruits that have fallen down, which harbor what? Spotted wing drosophila? Who knows what sort of um, fungus could be laying out there, um, you know, a food reserve for deer to come up and start nibbling on and stepping their hooves right into your plastic. So it behooves you to move for that cleanliness. But then in the IPM manual, if you wanted to mitigate mummy berry, mummy berry here's to, uh, just an example of what you would get out of the manual and what sort of chemistries you would have. Uh, it talks about resistance. It talks about the potential, the effectiveness of each one of the chemistries. So it's a very, very, very good source for a farmer. Then, of course, we've heard alluded to this. There's also in there uh, methods for dealing with spotted wing drosophila, which uh, is a horrible, nasty little thing, isn't it? And then um, also nut sedge. Um, huge problem down there. Even if you lay the plastic down, it just pops right out of it. But then there's some, there's some methods out there that are available on the IPM manual for that. You can really readily answer a lot of your questions right there with these IPM manuals. And I'd like to say thank you, and I would um, be more than willing to take some questions if there's some time. <laughs>